First time I read Tekon, I was staying at a friend's house. He had quite an extensive manga collection, and, and I had not read that much manga. A couple of Otomo's books, and the Yoshida Sensha, and just bits and pieces here and there. This was in, I guess, 94 or 95. Yeah, without even pausing, he gave me the three books. Um, the Tekon had just been released as a book. What he said when he gave them to me was, um, uh, which means uh, it's going to make you cry. And then he also says, you must read this. <laughs> I made like a little 30 second pilot. Well, not really a film, just one shot. It was meant to be a demo for a software I'd written. Tekken's author, Taya, liked what he saw enough to encourage me to do something more with it. And that was the beginning of the Tekken pilot project. In 1999, Michael Ayers made the first pilot version with the animator Koji Morimoto. But the whole project disappeared straight away. Now why was that? Koji wanted to do some experimentation with 3D. But when they actually started working on it, they both realized just how difficult it was to express emotions in 3D. And that says something because Mike was a man with decades of special effects experience. He was kind of a wizard in this and even created programs to be used by big companies on both sides of the oceans. Then a surprising turn happened at 4C. She suggested that I direct, then a, a guy I had already been working with, Koji Morimoto, also told me that I should direct it. He wasn't really interested anymore, and he wanted to work on his own films. Perhaps just to shut me up, because I was really obsessing. I had just finished Animatrix, which was incredibly successful, so I was able to raise a lot of money for Tekon. It wasn't a huge budget movie, but it had quite a good budget. He was really into tech on Kincrete, and he told me he actually only did the best for 4C because he wanted to make the tech on movie. Tanaka understood where Michael was coming from, as she'd always wanted to make the animated version since its inception in its original series of weekly manga magazine. This project would make Michael the first American to direct a full feature anime movie in Japan, and it was also Mike's first work as a director, so he had to take a lot of things on the chin. A lot of this all started really when a friend called the director. My best friend from college, Anthony, was doing some writing on Animatrix. He responded very strongly to the tech on manga and offered to write a screenplay on spec. That really got my juices flowing. And this is where it gets complicated because that scenario written by a foreigner was written in English. And when it was translated back to Japanese, the overall taste had changed quite a bit. And that almost caused a major crisis because they had to effectively reinterpret the whole thing. A lot of the original intention was lost in that translation, so it took a lot of time for them to find a new way of conveying it. And that puts the film in an interesting perspective because the English dub is the original version. Treasure Town has a certain je ne sais quoi. A never, never land, if you will. The manga itself is only about 33 chapters. And though it's not incredibly long, it has a very rambly, poetic feel, filled with subplots and background details that were tough to squeeze into a standard feature film, so Anthony and I had to make some difficult choices. They also had very little help from the mangaka himself, intentionally so. While he approved of the production, he only visited about twice because he was basically too tempted to make requests, so he left them to do what they wanted for the production. Speaking of differences in production, the storyboards here are actually quite different. Our character designer, Shojiro Nishimi, made all these kind of rules about the characters' personalities and how they act, what kind of poses and expressions they show, and in what situations. Then he made the character setting according to those rules. Other guys were working on the backgrounds, creating artistic settings, and put those two together and you get the storyboards. But in our case, we divided everything into 12 scenes, with three people working on the storyboards individually, like in a live-action film. During this process, we paid attention to the feeling of the characters in each scene. This is definitely an unusual way for an anime film, but Michael had no formal drawing skills, so he handpicked the right person for the mood he wanted for that specific scene. I think the first animators who came to the show might have been a bit circumspect, but once we finished shots to show off, getting talented animators was not a problem. There were around 30 people just in the main animation team, coordinated by the animation director. But it's more complicated than that. 
we have three departments working together, starting with the animators, then the illustration department, who are hand-painting the backgrounds and cityscapes, basically creating the world of Tech on Kincrete. And that was all fed into the CG department as they brought everything to life. I hate this town, you know? Oh, baby, I know. Come back here! There are a few reasons I went traditional for this film. First, I wanted to concentrate on directing, not CG animation or software. Second, I found a group of artists who I believe to be the most talented character animators on the planet. And I wanted them to work with the tools most familiar to them. Third, I really think hand-drawn character artwork is more expressive than 3D animation. As cool a project as it was, I was never entirely happy with the look of the characters in the pilot. One thing that I wanted to get away from was the feeling of, okay, here comes the big CG shot. Even a child can look at that and say, there's something weird about that. So my answer was to try and make the blend of traditional animated elements and computer-generated elements as organic as possible. So you couldn't really tell where one started and one ended. It was pretty much CG in every shot, including the vehicles, the backgrounds, a lot of the characters in the background. Basically, the whole city was constructed in such a way. Especially when you had hundreds of vehicles driving around, it would have been impossible with a production this small to do it otherwise. But the implementation works as they feel that they exist in the same world, despite it being slightly aged by time. It certainly feels connected. And that's not an easy feat. Even newer productions struggle with this. There's a freedom to move the camera, use motion birds, handheld fieldings, to give the movie its own style among the camera techniques, to make the city less static, more of its own person, like you're actually moving through it yourself. This is a very peaceful planet. Aging white, keeping the peace, doing my best to fight the bad guys wherever they may be, over and out. The uniqueness of each part of the setting also brings out the small sequences within them, so even the smallest moments can be memorable, while keeping the flair of the original manga. Off of mind game, Tekken might seem a little conservative in comparison, but the flat geometric characters stand out on their own. Kimura had just finished 10 years as an art director on Otomo's Steam Boy, and he definitely wasn't content to do more shades of grey. He really wanted to use colour freely, and I couldn't deny him that impulse. There was just a severe amount of research that went into designing the whole city and mapping out the entire sprawl. The art director had taken two years to do this, after all. Here's a movie where what you would normally call the background was actually the star character. And of course, that's the greatest thing you can tell an art director. We never just wanted to have the characters just sitting in front of the backgrounds. Takara Machi is depicted as a bustling early Showa-era theme park kind of world, but has its own character. Especially those who lived in Japan at the time would have really resonated with its style. And certainly, a city is nothing without its sound. Mike insisted that the band Plaid was the only band who could do it, and I think he was right too. It turned out they were actually recomposing the songs all over again after they saw our graphics, and in their final weeks they were sleeping in the studio, using a collapsing bed. The production was also matching a lot of the action with real-world sound effects to bring a grounded tone. Same with the character action, you know, bringing that parkour element not present in the manga, and it was a big trend in 2006, so I guess it's no surprise. They had to really understand how the film's protagonist would leap and scrape throughout. So then the further you fall into the story, the question becomes, where does reality stand, especially towards the final moments? Whatever the Minotaur represents, the true enemy of Tekon Kincrete reveals itself to be gentrification, the boundless profits of the machine over people. And there's actually a kind of parallel you can see within the movie's production, as its final months were crunch-laden. Compromises needed to be made, you see things like the watercolored sequences condensed using CG to fill in the frames, as they just didn't have time to draw that anymore out. Although at least in these situations, because of their surreal nature and otherworldly tone, there's a lot of leeway for what they could have done here. And the scenes themselves, the movements, and the action of it look great. We also see some predominant staff getting injured, as many people in the production are staying up all night just to try and hit these deadlines. The director had already been sleeping in the studio for almost a year. Tensions arose after the results of the work cut being less than expected. The crew were depressed, in a state of complete fatigue, with little time to fix it. The final sequence was pretty much a last minute decision. They didn't even know what they were going to do with it. I had first asked Morimoto to come in and be a special guest and direct that entire sequence. But we waited a year and only got a few pieces of concept art. And the clock was ticking, very much down to the wire. At that point, there was still no ending for the movie. And in the end, he just was too busy with other projects 
and I suspect he just didn't feel like working on someone else's film. But to his credit, I used all the art he did as a jumping off point for my board. Despite everything that went through, Tech on Kin Street came out as a success both technically and artistically. It did okay. It had a lot of dedicated fans, and it did win a Japanese Academy Award for Best Animated Feature, which was kind of a big deal. I had a huge amount of help from an incredibly talented artist, and even though the public likes to think the director is everything, he really is not. Hello there, we have Cat over here. And you have just watched a 4 Semba or a 4C month video. Now there's supposed to be a bunch of them, we're supposed to be releasing them every day after all, and at the end of the month we should have a full, expanded, revised version for everyone to see. If you want to keep checking them out, there should be a playlist probably on the screen, I'm guessing. And to thank everyone who has helped support me during this period of time, it's been a little bit hectic to try and get these videos out, I need to thank all my patrons who get exclusive content, I got a lot of stuff earlier, etc, etc. Jay, Steven's mum, Takeyuki Suzuki, Alex Moriarty, Paul, Sub Sofa, I hope I'm saying that right, and Chunks. Among all these other people, I've had to expand... I, we're in the editing dock right now, but I've had to expand the screen because I knew there was more space I needed to get all the names on there, so I've changed the angle slightly. Uh, yeah, thanks for everyone for their support. Check out tomorrow for the next video.